Hello, Journey family. My name is Matt Anderson, and I uh, run research here at The Journey and uh, do things like Mark Uncut. Uh, I have with me Aaron Layton. Uh, he has been at The Journey three years, and uh, he is one of the service pastors here at The Journey. He has a master's degree from uh, Covenant Theological mm -hmm. Seminary, and you teach full-time at Westminster Theological or mm -hmm. Westminster. Yeah, Westminster Christian Academy. Yeah, yeah. not quite Theological <laughs> Seminary, not yet. Um, he's been married 17 years. 17 years. Mm -hmm. Which is great. And you have two children? Two children, uh, Caleb and Kaylee. My wife's name is Gretchen. Uh, Caleb is uh, 11 and Kaylee's 10. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, um, we are going to talk through uh, a, a pretty confusing passage today. Uh, Mark uh, chapter 3, mm -hmm. verses 22 through 30. And I think it's confusing, obviously, because there's language in there about something that's called the unpardonable sin, yeah. uh, as it's frequently known. Mm -hmm. um, I think for people who have grown up inside the church, uh, who have come across this passage before, mm -hmm. or for maybe even more so people who are new to Christianity, uh, coming across this passage, we've, we've heard a lot that every sin is forgivable. Mm -hmm. And so to see Jesus say, there's one sin that seems to be unforgivable, right. it's, it's perplexing. Yeah. Um, what, what's the first thing okay. when we come across a, a confusing passage like this that we should do? I think the first thing you want to do is you want to read the passage again. Um, sometimes when we're, you know, the, the, the Bible, uh, the reading is a little bit different than, um, um, I guess, like a regular novel, like you would just kind of do some lay reading. Um, you really have to sometimes find the flow of thought, okay, right. what's going on, um, look at context clues and things like that. So the first thing I would say is just simply read the passage over again, that particular passage, and uh, see if you get some better understanding by just reading it through the first time. Right. That's scripture kind of Scripture is clear, but it's not necessarily obvious yeah. right away yeah. in, in some of these passages. You, yeah. You might have to do a little work. Yeah. And, that, and that's, a, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that out because on one hand, um, as far as being able to read, okay, yes, you can read Scripture, and God has given us His Spirit to help us understand the Word. However, you're talking about um, um, two different languages, uh, Hebrew and Greek, and then a translation into English. And those languages are quite different right. than English. And so what happens sometimes is you miss a lot of um, euphemisms. Um, the terminologies don't stack right on top of each other. Right. And so on one hand, yes, you can read the Bible, and you may be able to, to understand a term like, you know, uh, the, the Prince of Demons, which we'll talk about, or uh, Beelzebub, what does that mean, and, 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 and what would those readers have heard? Right. So, yes, you can read it as far as cognitively understanding, but there are some things that definitely need to be cleared up. Okay, yeah. well, that's very helpful. So, I read this passage again, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, and I take a look at it. still seems confusing to me. Mm -hmm. uh, what's, what should I do next? Well, the second thing um, is if you can try to find where that passage begins and ends. Okay. Um, especially like with the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, which, I mean, you're getting, um, you're getting the stories of Christ and his interaction with the disciples and people. And sometimes what happens is he, uh, he begins a discourse, okay, ends the discourse, and then the next passage may be them in another place, in another setting. Right. So if you can identify, okay, where does this passage actually begin and where does it end, okay, then it's more helpful to try to figure out what is he, what is he doing, what is he talking about in this. Okay. You know? oh, that's very interesting. Um, so once we identify the beginning and the end, and, and is it the case that in my New Testament it seems like there are already sort of built-in breaks? Should I mm -hmm. trust those? Are those yeah. you know, usually reliable? or? Yeah. Um, I would say yes and no. The interesting thing is um, the New Testament is written in Greek, and Greek didn't have any punctuation. I mean, the, everything just kind of ran together. Right. So you, you do need to know that um, although we've had scholars that have gone in and they've, you know, they've separated for organizational sake, especially in English, where, okay, they think chapter one is and the verses that flow with, with that particular chapter. However, understand that uh, the readers that were reading it, that, those, that first audience, they wouldn't have read it that way. I mean, it would have, right. you know, you would have had to pick up on where things begin and end. So sometimes you can trust those things, and I think the scholars have done a great job. However, there are times where, um, because of how things fit together, they've cut things off. Right. 
that actually didn't need to be cut off, you know, maybe a couple verses okay. short. They're know? not a part of the inspired yeah. word of God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and tech, actually this passage, I'm glad you, I was I was thinking about this. This passage, if you if you notice, um, the conversation from, from when Jesus selects the disciples. Right. And at the end of that passage, I think it's 13 through 20, at the end of it, it talks about his family and how his family thought right. he was out of, the, out of his mind. But then it goes on and talks about the Pharisees who actually thought he had a demon. So it's actually continuing. His family thought he was out of his mind. And then here are the Pharisees on top of that coming to say that, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's out of his mind. And so actually that 13, when he, when he selects the disciples, that discourse kind of actually continues into this one. Okay. If you look at it carefully. Right. So yeah. putting it in the context helps you see there's a lot of conflict going on mm -hmm. in Jesus' early ministry. And yeah. this seems to be a sort of heightened moment mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. That's really helpful. So um, we look at the passage, we determine the beginning and the end, mm -hmm. and sort of see it in its context, as mm -hmm. it were. Um, what, I mean, really, what then? Well, then, if you can try to identify uh, the main idea of, the, of that particular passage, recognize this, that in Scripture, and especially in the, the Gospels, Jesus is always making a point. Right. So that's the thing that you can... That you can um, you can kind of hang your hat on or rest in, okay, Jesus is always making a point, and I need to find out what is the point that he's making, not the point that I think, right. you know, um, based upon my understanding of Western culture and whatever. What is the point that Jesus is making? And um, there is always a point. So nothing's accidental. So let me ask with this passage then, which seems pretty perplexing, mm -hmm. what, what's the point that Jesus is making here? The main point that Jesus is making is that these the Pharisees, I think it was Pharisees or the or the scribes, right? Um, they saw the miracles that Jesus were, was performing, and they attributed those miracles to satanic power, hmm. although they knew that these miracles had to come from God. Right. So the the the, um, the sin in that was. The miracles that Jesus was performing were meant to validate the fact that he was indeed God and he was indeed the Son of God and that he right. had indeed been sent. Okay, So now the Pharisees and scribes, what they're doing is they recognize no one can do these things but God. But they're not saying that because they don't like Jesus. Right. Okay, So they're not saying this. So what they are doing on the other side is they're trying to persuade people that Jesus is actually not of God, but he's of the devil. Right. So the, the, the sin of blasphemy is this. When in your heart and mind you identify that something has been done by God, a miracle has been done by God, and you know it has been done by God, but then you attribute that power okay, to Satan. Right. So they were saying, Jesus, you didn't do this from, with the power of God, from the power of God. You did it from the power of Satan. But they knew the truth. Right. Okay. So it was. It was. It was very intentional. It, it's blasphemy is not a sin that you can just stumble up on. Right. Yeah. yeah. No. It's not something you do by accident. No. Say. And they're. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like they're also deliberately. Uh, th there's a sort of social dimension to that, right? They're telling others. Yes. They're trying to poison the well against uh, Jesus. They're yeah. sort of. Um, critiquing him publicly mm -hmm. and, and impugning his public ministry yes. as well. Is that, is that a part of this? Absolutely. They're trying to discredit the work of God in Christ. And so if you remember in some of the other Gospels where, where Jesus talks about, woe to you who cause those to stumble, these children to stumble. Right. In any way. And what he meant is stumbling toward, stumbling as it relates to understanding uh, the word of God and what God and, and his commands. And so here's a clear indication. So imagine you got a crowd of people. Jesus has been doing miracles. His di disciples are there. And you have these religious leaders who these people probably look up to. Right. Saying he's doing these miracles. The miracles that you are following him for, the miracles that you saw, he's doing these in the name of Satan and in, in the name of a prince of the demon. Right. So imagine how confusing that would be. Right. They're like, okay, yeah, these guys are, are, are the religious leaders of our community and we've known them for years. But now here's Jesus who we cannot deny the power of God in him. But there seems to be a conflict and I'm, I'm confused. Right. Then you can see 
where it is such a serious thing where you are standing in the way of the work of the Spirit. Right. And that's serious business. So this isn't just, I don't believe. No. Right? This isn't just, Jesus does some stuff, I see it, and I don't think that that's God. This is active opposition. Active opposition, intentional, because if it was just simple belief, here is one of the disciples, Thomas, who is riddled with unbelief at different points. Right. Which is more like, you know, probably those as, as, as we are coming into our faith, you have questions, you do. Um, and you and you have doubts. You just don't stay there. Right. But this is altogether di different, you know. Right. Um, they call doubting Thomas doubting Thomas because he doubted even even towards the end when Jesus comes back. He, Lord, I doubt that that's you. You right. know, let me put my fingers in your hands. But uh, but yeah, with something totally different here. Okay, so that's really helpful. So definitely, you know, nailing down what the main idea of the passage is and putting it in the context mm -hmm. too, and seeing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, opposition, some opposition from his family beforehand, seeing that that opposition is really heightened here. Yes. Uh, that seems to be really helpful. Um, what What should we do once we sort of get the main idea uh -huh. uh, and the big picture, if you will? What, yeah. What's next? I think if you get the main idea, um, another thing that will help you uh, with that is if you can identify any unfamiliar words or terms okay. in that passage, that's only going to help you. So. Um, you go through this passage, and like as I mentioned before, Prince of Demons, okay, what's that all about? Um, Beelzebub, right? You know, what's that all about? And then, and then, uh, even you know, uh, Satan, you know, those that may not be familiar with that term, you know, they may have you know, think of a guy in a pitchfork, but what is what does Jesus mean? Who is he talking to when he talks about Satan? So, I would, I would kind of either highlight or circle those terms, and this leads into my into, into my next point, yeah. um. Then if, if, if I have a study Bible, and I really believe that everybody should, every, every believer needs a good study Bible. Right. Um, I, you know, this is personal, no plug for the ESV study Bible. No, I was going to make <laughs> the plug as well. If you didn't, I was going to say it. <laughs> it is, and I've had, I, I've had many study Bibles. Yeah. And um, it's one of the best that I've seen. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is so concise, but at the same time, it's so impactful. And a lot of the research that I do in commentaries, I see it show up. In the ESV Study Bible, but in language that that everybody can understand. Right. So, um, so I have these terms, and I go to a study Bible, and if it's a, if it's a, if it's a if it's a decent study Bible, those terms that are unfamiliar to you, they'll pull those things out. You know, usually in the in the in the side on the side, and they will explain what those terms mean and what they meant to that first audience. Right. What did they hear? Right. Um, and so uh, that's helpful. That's going to give you notes and help you say, oh, I see, I see. Yeah, I may not have anything in my immediate uh, uh, culture that right. can relate to that. But yeah, this is going to help me, you know. And it seems like what's different about this, uh, the sort of going after the words and then, you know, getting to a tool mm -hmm. and helping you understand mm -hmm. the words. This is a, this is the nitty gritty side of things, yes. right? This is the details. Yeah. If you read the passage looking for the main idea, mm -hmm. that's a sort of big picture, right? Yes. You, you're looking for one big thing that right. this is about. Here it seems like you're looking for the little details yes. that might illuminate yeah. then what sure. what is really going on in the past. Yeah. Is that about right? Yes. And the 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 awesome thing about what you said, the exciting thing about what you said is here is this passage that multitudes of people have been clueless about and wondered if they've committed this sin and have it for whatever reason gone forward to say, what does that really mean? Right. But how crucial it is for them to have this information that we just shared with them. Right. And how, how valuable is it to my walk to know that, you know, I haven't committed the unpardonable sin, and now that I know what it is, I know that I won't because the Spirit of God is in me, right. you know, and I'm on Christ's side. But it's the same way with other passages. It is, for the believer, it is worth wrestling with, Right. you know. Um, it's the same thing like on your job when um, there's a new product that comes out, you know, or you have new technology at work and your employer makes sure, okay, you know how to use it effectively right. because it enhances all that you do, all the people you serve, you know. How much more God's word? So um. yeah, no. When I was a kid, I mean, I had a lot of anxiety about whether or not I yeah. had committed this sin. Yeah, I mean, we all did. You sort yeah. of read it and think, was that me? I don't know. Yeah. Okay, so we we get to the Bible, uh, the the study Bible. Mm -hmm. 
um, we look up, you know, see if there's something mm -hmm. there. What if it's not there? What if, yeah. um, or what if I still have questions? What yeah. if it doesn't satisfy my, my desire for understanding? Yeah. What, what, what do I well, do? Well, the first thing I would say, if, if you've gone to the study Bible and you've done all these steps, you've done these five steps and you're still not satisfied, I'm like, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, as a pastor, I mean, that is like, this is a dream, you know, congregation member that said right, pastor. Right. So know, don't be satisfied <laughs> with that is the lesson. Yeah, that's exciting. Um, I think from this point, what I would, uh, encourage you to do is to go to a couple commentaries. Okay. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many, um, and, and I'm sure, you know, we can, we can, we can, we can put some yeah, we'll, out we'll as, as a out. journey, we'll out but a yeah, grab two or three commentaries and, and go specifically to that passage and see what insight those scholars have that have wrestled with these things, know the languages in and out. And, uh, it would be, it, it's, it's always exciting to me because there are things that, that these guys have studied for years that never even occurred to me. Right. Never even occurred, but, but it's so helpful right. and so fruitful and is definitely um, worth your time. Um, and so uh, find some commentaries um, and, and uh, see what they have to say. It seems like that's a sort of form of um, almost reading in community with mm -hmm. people who aren't right, right by you, right? It's, exactly. It's not just you in the text yes. uh, struggling with this alone. It's mm -hmm. you with a bunch of other people. Yeah. Um, are there others that we should bring into that process? Oh, I think absolutely. The last and uh, in, in final step, if you will, number seven, I would say if uh, you're in a community group, your community group leader, um, when we led a community group, I love the fact that I would have um, one young man in particular, uh, after Darren's sermons, I mean, he would come back and, and he would take these notes and he would say, he said this, what does he mean and what does this passage mean? Right. So I would say, you know, those that are in your community that are leaders, that teach the Bible, that have, you know, some knowledge that may be, you know, uh, beyond yours, without a doubt, go to them. That's what the community is for. That's right. one of the things that it's for. You know, it's not just for comfort in times of need, but we are to learn as a community. So right. I would say your community group leader, um, if uh, you know, there is a, you know, a, a, teach, a service pastor or a teaching pastor um, uh, that you can get to, an elder that you can get to, or someone you may know uh, uh, that loves the studying God's word, um, and, and then, you know, if you can get to your, if you can get to your pastor, I mean, even maybe, you know, and today shoot him an email, right? Um, and, 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 you know, and uh, give him some time to get back to you. But I think, I think if, if you, if you go through those steps, um, you will be the better for it. Uh, so let me ask you this. So we go through all these steps. Um, and I think one question that a lot of people are going to be really wrestling with, with this passage in particular mm -hmm. is, um, so active opposition mm -hmm. to the, the ministry of Jesus mm -hmm. and a sort of hostility to the work of God in this world mm -hmm. um, that where we recognize that it is the work of God yeah. and we still oppose that. Mm -hmm. um, is it really, I mean, this, this could be a hard question and um, I think I don't know how to answer this, which is what I'm going to ask you uh, and learn from community <laughs> and whatnot. <laughs> um, is it really unpardonable? I mean, is it really the case that there is one sin uh, and one sort of way of life that yeah. is yeah. outside the boundaries of forgiveness? Yeah, I think I, I, think I, I want to say two things. You know, this is the, what Jesus himself calls the unpardonable sin. And if you think about it, I understand why. Because no one who, um, no one who has the Spirit of God living in them um, would say those things. Right. You know, this is someone, this is someone who is in direct willful opposition. Right. Um, we know that it, it takes, it, it takes repentance, okay, a turning in order to even come into the kingdom of God. And of course, you know, this, the spirit does a work in you. Right. But we know that it takes repentance. Jesus came uh, preaching a, a gospel of repentance, you know. Right. So, but without repentance, without an acknowledgement that you are wrong or, or in error, um, there can be no there can there can be no repentance because right. you don't feel like you have anything to repent for. Right. You're not you're not you're there's nothing about your lifestyle that you think you have to apologize for. Right. And therefore, um, you know, you are walking in darkness, you right. know. And so and you know, in that sense, tied to the, the sin of blasphemy, the unpardonable sin, um, it is it is it is a willful act that you you don't desire 
Okay, you don't desire to attribute those things that come from God um, to God. Right. You desire the other. I mean, and you can see, if you really think about it, you can see the evil and the wicked intent um, um, for someone to know that something is of God. Right. But you boldface lie with the intent to cause others to stumble right. as it relates, you know. Especially, and we should point out, especially if you're a spiritual authority exactly. within a community too. Exactly. Right? Like, you should, yeah. You know, if, if a pastor of a church mm -hmm. were to say that, it might be different than, yes. you know, someone like me without a sort of spiritual authority yes. in the community yeah. leading others astray yeah. and, and yeah. intentionally doing exactly. that. Exactly. And, 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 and the second point with that is there are people that are in opposition to the things of God because their heart's darkened, right. you know? And I think that's a different thing. You got people that are cynics, um, people that consider themselves atheists, right. um, and, you know, they may, they, they may spout off things like, you know, God doesn't exist. Um, those things are in a different category, okay? Yeah. Those things, those things are in a different category because, uh, they haven't been enlightened to the fact that there is a God. Right. It seems like people who are atheists wouldn't necessarily attribute these works to Satan. Right. right. If, you're, if you're an atheist, yeah. I don't think that you think Satan exists. Exactly. Right? Like, you, yeah. you have no framework in which to, yeah. to sort of attribute that to yeah. the opposition, as it were. Yeah. We're talking about someone who is spiritually enlightened enough to say, yes, there is a God. Right. Yes, I know that this man, Jesus, is of God, and I see the miracles that he does. But I, I'm not going to say that they're from God. I'm going to say they're from the devil because I have another agenda that I want to promote more than that. Right. You know. Um, so those that you have people that are going to oppose the things of God because they are walking in darkness, and that's where we come in, um, and that's the mission of the church. Yeah. Um, but that's it. You know, you get those that are that are that are going to uh, be obstinate, that are are in rebellion. Um, but that's a different thing because they are they're groping around in darkness because they cannot see, you know. Well, this is very helpful. I think this uh, hopefully clears up a lot yeah, of I hope people's so. questions. <laughs> um, let me say this in closing, uh, if you're watching. Um, if you still have questions, uh, feel free to leave us a comment. Leave yeah. us the questions. Uh, yeah. I think, you know, if I can sure. enlist you to come in and help out. Oh, if I'd there, love to. Yeah. Uh, you know, questions on the city as well, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, but we'll certainly try to answer as many as we can. And um, we'll also point out a few resources uh, on the post below as well. Uh, if you want to do further study, a few commentaries yeah. um, that we can sort of point you to as well. Uh, Aaron, I really appreciate this. Oh, I no think problem. it's really helpful. Well, it's uh, um, it's one of my pastors help people understand scripture. So this is this is this is a treat for me. To yeah, God, no, to God be the glory. So it's our pleasure. It's yeah. our pleasure. And again, uh, if you have questions, let us know um, and stay tuned. Uh, the next uh, iteration of Mark Uncut uh, for next week, uh, which will be. Uh, loving on on loving those who have left the faith uh, which is the next That's section good. that we're going to cover so stay tuned for that yeah. um, and we will see you again